showing. Well, we had already had to pay for the hours we were in there, so I got into the habit of, first of all, writing a character into the script saying, okay, this character will be my character, and if someone doesn't show up, then I will step into the booth and record that voice. Uh, the other thing we did to fill that time was we got into the habit of bringing in people from around ADV to do background fill-in voices, and a lot of the voice acting you'll hear in the background you know, things like people screaming and that sort of thing uh, are actually people in the office while we're throwing bricks and things at them. Uh, some of those people actually turned out to be really great actors. And you'll hear people like Doug Smith uh, in the background who went on to play Golden Boy, and just uh, one of the people in the art department with a natural gift for mimicking voices. And when Golden Boy came up, he really wanted to go for the part. We auditioned him, and he got it. But he uh, had done a number of other things. And... Uh, You'll hear uh, Lorraine Reyes, who was the uh, art director at the time, doing some of the background voices. She was probably the biggest Ava fan at, uh, of anyone in the company at the time. She had seen the entire series in the raw Japanese and was kind of like our unofficial guru. Uh, like, uh, hey, Lorraine, uh, what do you think uh, about this? And she was like, well, blah, 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 blah. If she didn't have an opinion, she'd call some of her friends who were also big Ava fans and kind of get a consensus back. At the same time, we were also getting feedback directly from Japan, although it was very strange around about. I would write uh, an ADR script, and it would get sent to Japan via one licensor, and then it would go round robin to like three or four of the licensors in Japan, and finally come back to me, usually a day after we had started recording, covered with little red pencil marks saying, oh, you need to change this, you need to change this, you need to change this. Uh, we actually did fix one of those for this edition. Uh, people who know the show will probably catch where we fixed it because it was an error that the translator made that somehow went through a half dozen hands and never got caught until after the DVD was actually, or the, actually the VHS was released. And it stayed there uh, until now, but we did fix it. Uh, for this edition. That is the only new line recorded. Uh, but, so we would get these things back with changes and sometimes realize the changes meant redoing huge chunks of the show. Uh, so we would go through back and re-record things. We would have to change things around uh, simply to accommodate some very odd wording changes. Uh, it's not that the, the wording that we were changing to was, was odd per se, except that it was like, okay, they're really specific about wanting to invert the positions of these two words. Uh, and that apparently made a big difference to them, so we would move things around. And we had a couple of things where we would get into arguments uh, about, for example, the three kids, uh, are referred to as the three children. Uh, but when you uh, have them singular, uh, one of them by themselves, the Japanese kept correcting the script to say, well, this is the first children, this is the second children, this is the third children. And we had to keep coming back saying, um, you know, that just doesn't make sense in English. But sometimes you would get these things that they had decided they wanted for the English version. For example, the fact that the, uh, the attacking entities are called the angels. Well, that's really not what the word in the Japanese translates too exactly. It's closer to something like a emissary or maybe an apostle. But they really were, were fixated on the idea of having angel. And it, it works well in the context of the show. You need something like that uh, to give it a dynamic. And if it was the emissaries or whatever, it just would not have had the same ring. So I, I give them full props for understanding that. On the other hand, uh, there were occasions where you'd be going like, I don't really quite understand why you're doing this, but if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. Uh, if you'll notice, in between each and every one of the episodes, there'll be two uh, titles, once in Japanese, once in English. They are not the same titles. The show has separate titles for the first and half of each episode, and each version has an English version and a Japanese version. They may match, they may not. So sometimes those aren't translation errors that uh, people notice. It's the variations in what the two titles mean. All of this we had to deal with at a very breakneck production speed. Uh, we were at the initially starting off with two episodes at a time, uh, and we would do them, send them out uh, to be mixed uh, by Paul Killam, who was doing the original mixes. And in between when we did the mixes and, and the final 
release, we would half the time get a correction come in that just absolutely had to be done. Uh, so we would have to go back and do it. It was very frantic. And this was in between working with a half dozen other shows at the same time. Uh, that's why Amanda Wynn uh, came on as my co-director for the, the first dozen or so episodes of the show uh, because the way we were working at the time was that I would direct uh, the key characters and then she would go in and direct other scenes and as we progress she started doing more of the key characters uh, but eventually uh, we came to the situation where I ended up directing the entire thing uh, for the last batch of episodes it was uh, it was incredibly hectic and I would never go back and do it that way again but at the time uh, because of the nature of all the constant changes it was the only way to keep things moving smoothly and when I went back into the director's cuts I was really actually kind of surprised at how smooth the last couple of episodes were compared to the earlier ones and I think that's partially um, because our actors had gotten so much more accustomed to the process. I'm talking about recording the uh, the new versions of the dialogues. We had to re-record a lot of dialogues for the director's cut version, and partially because the uh, the intervening years had made it a lot more crystal clear as to what was really going on. Uh, I've had a lot of time to think about Ava and live with Ava in my head and go over it, and I've read a lot of stuff in between things on uh, Asian philosophy. And what really helped more than anything else was working on the show Gasaraki, where it was a similar situation to Ava, where we were working very closely with the creators, but without the buffer of a half dozen licensors between us. And on Gasaraki, I was fortunate I could actually send an email, and it would go to the person who actually did something. And they set me on a lot of trains of thought, uh, research, that really helped understand what the dynamic they were really going for as an undercurrent and once I had that idea that's what they were trying to do I could look back and say okay this is also what they were trying to do on Ava uh, at the time when I was doing Ava originally it was more a question of okay I know the story points and I know where it ends and I know the double meanings on everything uh, I'd watched the show twice all the way through uh, with the full translations but just because I knew what was going to happen, what was going on, there were some elements that you come back and think afterwards, like, there's so many potential meanings in there. And I think initially my first time through, I was very literal. And then the second time through, I got a little bit maybe too metaphysical on the meaning. Uh, but it all came out pretty well. It's just, it's it's an interesting show because a lot of what what people react to in Ava, frankly, are red herrings. There's a lot of stuff that's put out there that appears to have a great deal of meaning that doesn't really have as much meaning as they would like you to believe, but they're trying to make you think. They're trying to make your brain function a little bit more efficiently. And so if they throw a lot of things out there that don't necessarily connect completely, it still accomplishes the goal of putting into your mind that, okay, look around the corners, look underneath things. Uh, this is an interesting bit right here. I'd completely forgotten about some of these things until we did the director's cut, and I'd forgotten that uh, one of the big problems we had was that a lot of the sound effects work we were getting wasn't complete, and one of the things we found that was missing was, strangely enough, the sound effects of the Ava, which, as we go into the next episode, uh, they make this long, screaming sound, which if you actually take the Japanese version and pitch it up, you realize it's actually an actor uh, just sitting there on the soundstage making the sounds. Uh, and I ended up doing all of those for the series. I had completely forgotten about that until we did the director's cut. And there was a, a bit where we had to do it. I'm like, oh my god, I've forgotten about that. Uh, but that's the, the problem you run into when you're working on a, a show that's being done on that kind of rush basis. Is you, you get materials and you're like, oh, okay, do we have everything? It looks like everything's there. And then while you're recording in the booth, you're like, ooh. You know what? There's a sound effect missing there. That coffee cup sound's not there. It's it's a minor thing, but we ended up folding a lot of that stuff live. And uh, 
when now that we're going back and doing the director's cut and that those effects are actually in there we're having to cut that stuff back out again it's kind of funny uh well we're going to go ahead and wrap up this section and bring in mr spike spencer the ava triumphs but this angel is only the beginning worried about 